Uh, the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service in the District of Columbia hearing will now come to order. I welcome my friend, Ranking Member Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, members of the Subcommittee, hearing witnesses and all those in attendance. The purpose of today's hearing is to review the existing temporary hiring authorities and current regulations and the resulting impact on temporary employees' status and benefit offerings. The Chair, the Ranking Member, and the Subcommittee members will each have five minutes within which to make an opening statement and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. A hearing, no objection, so ordered. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the duty of this subcommittee to look after every single federal employee, no matter the level of pay or what type of schedule or seniority they may have. I've called today's hearing to discuss issues relating to temporary employees who represent about 9% of the total federal workforce. We know that seasonal temporary employees play a critical role in helping an agency accomplish its mission and carry out its mandates, yet these employees are operating largely under the radar screen. Given the fact that in certain federal entities, namely the National Park Service and the Forest Service, seasonal temporary employees can comprise approximately 40 percent of the workforce at any given time, it is important that we take time to seriously consider issues and concerns currently confronting this particular employee population. Oftentimes, seasonal temporary employees have worked in the same capacity year after year, decade after decade. However, they receive no health care, retirement, insurance, or other regular benefits accrued by otherwise permanent or term employees of the federal government. While in the early 1990s, regulatory changes were made to reduce temporary employees' assignment time from four years to a maximum of total of two, uh, thereby limiting the possibility of temporary employee abuses, it is clear that renewed oversight on this issue is needed. As we explore existing temporary hiring authorities and current regulations, I believe it's important that we consider whether a path to permanency can be established for our temporary em employees, many of whom have worked for multiple years and are fully cognizant of the merit principles in our hiring. Additionally, we need to look at how we can harness the sizable talent and information acquired by these temporary employees. Today's hearing will also provide us the chance to hear from the employer as well as the employee side of the temporary hiring issue. My intent is for this afternoon's hearing to provide all of us with an opportunity to further the dialogue on various ideas and suggestions on how we can best reach a middle ground on some of these issues so that our employees are properly taken care of without agency budget being overly stretched. It's my hope that the testimony and feedback we receive from today's witnesses will provide the subcommittee with precise guidance and direction. Again, I thank each of you for being with us this afternoon, and I look forward to your participation. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses uh, for being here and the preparation you put forward. This testimony is important as we, uh, we dive into this issue. Temporary employees provide federal agencies with flexibility needed to handle temporary increases in workload, such as seasonal work and short-term projects, or to hire people to fill in behind permanent employees as an extended leave of absence, such as parental leave. These positions are not intended to be used as tryouts or as substitutes to buffer the full-time workforce. Congress and the Office of Personnel Management must continue to work diligently to ensure that agencies comply with the statutory and regulatory uh, framework and limitations on the use of temporary uh, workers. At the same time, any statutory or regulatory change must be approached with caution to ensure that effective workforce an effective workforce while limiting spending and maintaining the flexibility this system is intended to provide. In 1998, the last time the Office of Personnel Management estimated the cost of extending health and pension benefits to temporary workers, it estimated the total cost of providing these benefits to the 102,000 plus uh, temporary employees would be in excess of $784 million. Today, there's something like in the, in the ballpark of 183,000 temporary workers, and like all federal employees, their salaries have grown significantly since 1998. In a year when the federal deficit is projected to exceed at least last, exceed last year's record high of $1.4 trillion and unemployment is in the range of 9.7 percent across the country, a billion dollar increase in spending would be obviously irresponsible. 
I look forward to hearing suggestions from today's witnesses on how the Office of Personnel Management and Congress can work together to ensure agencies use temporary workers in accordance with, standard, uh, with standing regulations and statutes. I look forward to the interaction. And again, I, I thank you for being here. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And <laughs> I thank you for this hearing and, and regret that this hearing is necessary um, because this, this issue came up uh, not shortly after I came to Congress, almost 20 years ago. And I wonder if we're seeing uh, progress. I note that the number of temporary employees has gone up. That doesn't in and of itself bother me. Uh, because they are increasing uh, numbers of temporary employees, and they have very satis it's, it's a very satisfactory status to many to many people. Um, but I think at this hearing, we need to find out whether temporary status is being abused or if it simply uh, doesn't work the way we are we are uh, implementing it. Um, I am particularly concerned, uh, Mr. Chairman, that in the year in which we have just passed a uh, monumentally historic health care reform bill, these workers apparently still cannot get access to health care unless they pay for it entirely. I cannot understand how anybody working for the federal government would be put in that position for any period of time. And we'll be very interested to know whether or not the health care bill we just passed makes any difference with respect to that status. Very concerning, too, is um, uh, the lack of any retirement benefits. Now, a time limit was put on the number of years you could uh, serve temp as a temporary employee. And, and I, don't, I don't have objections to that. Um, but uh, I, I'm wondering, I don't, the reason I don't have objections to it, at least as it stands now, is, is that we want to preserve the merit system as the way to hire employees. On the other hand, I'm troubled by reports of, um, uh, of uh, temporary employees uh, who are working far longer than the two-year limit because that can be waived. And I think the reason probably is that their experience is needed. Uh, I do uh, uh, join the ranking member in, in, in understanding the need for flexibility here, but flexibility should not come with uh, a, abuse. Uh, there was a, the case that first led to reforms uh, involved a man from the District of Columbia who worked three shifts over July 4th and dropped dead from it. He had a wife and five or six children and nothing to show for it. Uh, I went to the floor with a bill, and a bill for a single individual is very rare in this House. But uh, the, the, the House and the Senate uh, saw this as not only a signal that there was reform needed, but that something had to be done for this man, and we were able to get some funds for him. I regret to see now that perhaps too little was done and hope to learn more from this hearing about what more needs to be done consistent with maintaining the flexibility of temporary employment, which is employment that is not only to the benefit of the federal government, but many others who work in part-time positions as well. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for continuing to tackle one of the more intractable challenges facing our federal workforce. Widespread agency abuse of temporary hiring practices is both a symptom of a broken hiring system and an ongoing impediment to the long-range recruitment and retention of the high-caliber employees we need in the federal government. The Office of Personnel Management needs to use its administrative authority to the maximum extent possible to crack down on agencies' abuse of temporary hiring is a logical accompaniment to the implementation of the President's recently announced hiring reforms, which I, for one, welcome. One reform OPM could implement would be to close the loophole, allowing repeated temporary hires of seasonal employees who work less than six months in a year. Temporary hiring has all too frequently been abused as a de facto means of retaining long-term employees to save money in the short run at the expense of both the federal employee and federal efficiency in the long run. 
It's not surprising that agencies use temporary hiring authorities, including the misnamed Federal Career Internship Program, to fill employment positions since the current hiring process is so inefficient. Fortunately, President Obama and OPM Director Berry are taking aggressive steps to reform that process by eliminating KSA essay requirements and streamlining hiring on USA jobs. These reforms will allow agencies to fill job positions more readily with permanent employees hired under merit principles. For their part, agencies must take advantage of the opportunity and begin making progress to reverse the 25,000 position growth in temporary employment that occurred between 1992 and 2009. I look forward to hearing the Forest Service plans for reforming abuse of temporary hiring authority. An extraordinary 53 percent of Forest Service employees who responded to a National Federation of Federal Employees survey said that they had been temporarily hired for five or more seasons, even though the Merit System Protection Board advised that temporary employment policy should be based on the assumption that the employment will normally be on a one-time, short-duration basis. Many of these temporary employees are, in fact, long-term dedicated public servants. For example, Forest Service fire crews who serve year after year, from June to October, or longer, may be seasonal, but they surely are not temporary. Many of these Forest Service positions involve hard, dangerous labor. It's morally repugnant to exploit temporary hiring authority to avoid providing Forest Service employees the benefits that, in fact, they've earned through what is frequently long-term service and certainly dangerous. This is not principally an issue of workers' rights, however, but rather federal efficiency and productivity. We must remain focused on recruiting and retaining the best employees in what is frequently a very competitive job market. In order to recruit and retain the best employees who will serve our constituents, we must ensure that agencies are offering basic benefits rather than long-term temporary employment that does an injustice to both federal employees and, in the long run, the taxpayers themselves. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Again, I want to welcome our witnesses. It is the custom before this committee that all witnesses are sworn. Uh, could I ask you to please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, let the record indicate that all of the witnesses have uh, answered in the affirmative. What I will do is offer a brief introduction of the, uh, the witnesses, and uh, then each will be afforded five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, just for the beginning, uh, the small boxes in front of you on the table uh, will indicate uh, will green uh, while your time is uh, proceeding, then uh, yellow when it's time to wrap up, and then uh, red when you should uh, stop testifying. And uh, Let me begin. Uh, Mr. Jerry Simpson began his federal career with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1967. In 2006, he left NASA to join the National Park Service. Mr. Simpson currently serves as the Associate Director of Workforce Management for the National Park Service, where his duties include ensuring effective utilization of federal employees, concession employees, cooperators, contractors, and volunteers. Mr. Hank Cashton has served the National Forest Service for 35 years and is currently the Forest Service's Associate Chief. During his tenure with the Forest Service, Mr. Cashton has served in a variety of roles, including his appointment as Deputy Chief for Business Operations. Ms. Angela Bailey was selected for the Senior Executive Service in October of 2007 after 26 years of public service. She currently serves as Deputy Associate Director for the Recruitment and Diversity at the Office of Personnel Management. Prior to joining the Office of Personnel Management, Ms. Bailey worked for the Social Security Administration and the Department of Defense. Mr. Simpson, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss issues facing temporary In the interest of time, I'll Mr. Simpson, is your microphone on? I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Okay, take it from the um, top. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to appear today uh, to uh, discuss issues facing temporary employees. In the interest of time, I'll summarize my written testimony and then answer questions you may have. For many years, the Park Service has relied heavily on a seasonal workforce to 
augment its permanent staff. Today we hire approximately 10,000 seasonal employees every year to provide critical services, especially during peak summer visitation. The variety of positions that we hire includes maintenance workers, rangers, both law enforcement protection and interpretation, fee collectors, biological technicians, landscape architects, firefighters, lifeguards, just to name a few. Seasonal positions in the Park Service are very competitive and the number of applicants usually far exceeds the, the number of available positions. We use temporary hiring authorities to fill many of these positions, often through open competitive examination <coughs> procedures. However, we may also give temporary appointments non-competitively to certain individuals and we do make use of the Student Educational Employment Program to non-competitively fill positions performing seasonal work. The Park Service is concerned about the morale and the equitable treatment of our seasonal workforce. Because the Employee Viewpoint Survey conducted by OPM is only distributed to permanent employees, we recently completed a comparable internal survey distributed to approximately 6,000 of our employees uh, who were hired after June 2009, including seasonal employees. According to the survey, our seasonal employees, like their permanent coworkers, derive very high satisfaction from their belief that the work they do is important and that they like the work that they do. Their greatest dissatisfiers, however, are with the lack of health and retirement benefits, the lack of job security, and the lack of equity with permanent staff, particularly where promotions and within grade pay increases are at stake. Approximately 43% of those survey respondents indicated they were considering leaving the Park Service within the next year. We have formed an internal work group to help address these issues and we will actively be working those in the coming year uh, within existing regulatory and budgetary, budgetary constraints. Though seasonal employees are not eligible for participation in the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, we do make available to all of our seasonal employees when they first start work information about private health insurance that is provided available to them through the Association for National Park Rangers, which is a nonprofit employee organization. We are vigilant in monitoring our use of temporaries. We conduct multiple audits annually to ensure compliance with the temporary hiring laws, regulations, and the time limits imposed on these appointments by OPM guidelines. Over the past three years, the Park Service has conducted between 15 and 20 of these reviews with an OPM staff member as a member of each review team, and we have found no major compliance issues in these areas. So in summary, the use of temporary hiring authorities is critical to the Park Service. They play a role in our seasonal recruitment efforts and they allow us to meet our NPS mission. We strive to ensure that our use of authorities is in compliance with civil service laws and regulations, but we would welcome the opportunity to work with the committee and other agencies and departments to explore potential solutions to the issues that will be discussed today. So Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Simpson. Mr. Cashin, welcome. You now recognize for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Lynch, uh, Mr. Bilbury, Ms. Norton, Mr. Connolly. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about a very critical segment of the uh, workforce that delivers the Forest Service mission, that being the uh, temporary seasonal workforce. In addressing the subcommittee's concerns about temporary hiring authorities and benefits, legislative issues and qualification for permanent jobs, I think it's important to just lay out an employment profile for the agency. At, at any given time in the Forest Service, we'll have up to about 30,000 uh, career employees. At this time of the year, the end of June, early July, we'll increase that number to almost 45,000, adding 15,000. Uh, temporary seasonals to the workforce uh, and that typically hits its height right about this time of the year. These employees are primarily field employees. They'll work in uh, wildlife habitat management, watershed restoration, recreation management, forest products, and the, the big employer being uh, wildfire suppression. Our field seasons vary. Uh, in the southern tier of the United States, that field season may uh, last all, all, uh, all year. In the uh, northeast and the northwest, as well as Alaska, that field season can be fairly short, three and four months. So in addressing the question of how long does a uh, temporary last, I'd, I'd like to address it from a, um, a strictly plain and simple business model standpoint, as well as an empathetic standpoint, trying to put myself in the shoes of a temporary employee. From, from the business model standpoint, I, I think there's, there, there are some the basic attributes that we have to consider. Most of the Forest Service field work is in fact seasonal. 
winter type or non-season office work is different than seasonal field work. Uh, as as a, uh, an executive in the agency that manages the workforce, I think there's an important aspect of the budget profile that necessitates having a reasonable level of discretionary costs compared to fixed costs. Uh, as an executive, I look at 20 to 30 percent of uh, our budget profile being discretionary as a reasonable level to achieve. Seasonal employees are in the discretionary category along with grants, agreements, contracts, and procurement. Uh, permanent employees would be in the fixed cost category along with uh, infrastructure. Now that's the very plain and simple budget profile. In the workforce profile, it's very important for the agency's employment profile to represent a variety of sources uh, from which employees uh, are derived. This includes veterans, interns in college, placements from Job Corps, presidential management fellows, returning Peace Corps volunteers, and from the ranks of seasonal workforce. And let me just add that that seasonal workforce um, provides about 44 percent of our current career uh, workforce in the agency. So it's the single largest component. Uh, now, from, that's the business model that I think it's important to pay attention to. From the empathy standpoint, I do identify with seasonal employees who want career jobs. I started as a seasonal. Uh, the chief of the Forest Service, Tom Tidwell, was a seasonal. We both uh, moved into the career ranks and achieved the positions we have today. Many seasonals desire career positions. We want seasonals to fill career jobs. But it's also important to note that some seasonal employees do not look for a career in the Forest Service. Uh, there's a good percentage of employees that are attending school. Uh, they, they work for the, in the summertime. There are teachers who uh, teach during the school year and work in the summertime. And then there are others who pursue, uh, who are, have other pursuits that uh, is, is uh, 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 complementary to a, uh, a seasonal workforce. Now, back to the, uh, the employees that do want a job, I, I, I do have a personal empathy. My son is a five-year seasonal. Uh, he's very frustrated with the, uh, the process of, of trying to become a career employee. He told me just last week he's sick of filling out job applications. Uh, so I can identify with that. We've had some tough love conversations about this very issue. And what I tell him are the, are the four things that I tell anybody who asks me about a, getting a career job. You have to go where the jobs are. You have to do a job, you may have to do a job you don't want in order to get your foot in the uh, career employment uh, category. You should consider uh, serving your country in the military and getting veterans preference or joining the Peace Corps and coming back with a non-competitive uh, uh, placement authority or consider going back to school. If you can't do one or more of these things, the reality is, is that you do limit yourself in pursuing a career position. So in closing, Mr. Chairman, let me just acknowledge that there, the union particularly, is, and I have discussed the issue of a pathway to permanence right now. Should the administration and Congress consider those type of um, incentives for long-term seasonals, we're uh, happy to provide our input and take part in that dialogue. So that concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cashman. Uh, Ms. Bailey, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Office of Personnel Management regarding temporary employment in the federal government. Federal agencies use temporary appointments when they do not need an employee's services permanently. These appointments are used in a variety of circumstances, including when an office is scheduled to be reorganized or abolished to complete a specific short-term project or to meet peak workload demand. Some employees serving under temporary appointments are employed seasonally. That is, they work during certain times of the year on a reoccurring basis. The term seasonal refers to the employee's work schedules and not their appointment type. Some seasonal workers are temporary, while others serve under permanent appointments. I will elaborate on that in a moment. Temporary appointments are limited to one year or less. They can be extended for a maximum of one additional year. Generally, an agency may not fill a position by temporary appointment if that position has been filled by temporary appointment for an aggregate of 24 months within the preceding three-year period. OPM regulations require that the supervisor of each position filled by temporary appointment must certify that the need for the position is truly temporary and that the appointment meets the regulatory time limits. The certification must include the specific reason for using a temporary appointment. 
Let me review why these limitations were imposed. Until 1985, temporary appointments were much like they are today. Appointments were limited to one year with a maximum one year extension. In 1985, OPM made several policy changes to give agencies greater flexibility to meet mission and budgetary challenges. From 1985 through 1994, temporary appointments could be extended for up to four years in one year increments. There was no limit on the number of times the position could be filled using temporary appointments. One of the consequences of this situation was that many temporary employees developed an expectation of continuing employment because agencies could appoint them to successive temporary appointments sometimes for decades. One example of this was the tragic case of James Hudson, an employee of the National Park Service who died on the job. Because he was a temporary employee, albeit with more than eight years of service, his family was not eligible for certain benefits they would have received had he been serving under a permanent appointment at the time of his death. OPM re-examined the use of temporary appointments and in 1994 revised the rules governing them. We prescribed the limitations I outlined in order to ensure that temporary appointments will be used for truly short-term hiring needs and to avoid the perception by employees that temporary employment could last indefinitely. Our regulations provide for limited exceptions from the time limits. Agencies can ask OPM for exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis only when required by major reorganizations, base closings, or other unusual circumstances. OPM requires agencies to submit a work-related justification for each request. In addition, OPM regulations provide an exception to the time limits for work that is expected to last less than six months each year. The reason for this exception is that some agencies need to be able to bring back some employees on a seasonal basis. In contrast to seasonal employees who work more than six months in a year and who therefore must be employed under permanent appointments, those who work less than six months a year may be given temporary appointments that can be renewed multiple times. This exception allows agencies to limit the number of permanent employees they hire while retaining the flexibility to employ seasonal workers whose services are needed for less than six months each year. A concern that is often raised with respect to employees serving under temporary appointments is that they are excluded from coverage under the retirement programs for federal employees. Retirement coverage is generally not in the interest of either these employees or the agencies they work for. This is true because of the requirement that an individual must work for at least five years in covered employment in order to become entitled to an entity, an, an annuity. Most temporary employees never fulfill this five-year requirement, so it does not make sense for them to have contributions to the retirement system withheld from their pay. As is the case with retirement coverage, the laws governing the federal employees' health benefits and federal employees' group life insurance programs authorize OPM to exclude certain categories of employees from coverage based on the nature and type of their employment. Consequently, employees serving under temporary appointments are generally excluded from coverage under the health and life insurance programs. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss with you how temporary employment is used in the federal government and how and why it affects employee benefits. I would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. I want to welcome uh, Mr. Bill Bray uh, to this hearing. Let me start with you, Mr. Simpson. Uh, I understand from your testimony that a substantial number of your employees serve on a temporary basis. I, I, I do have to note the, the, the oxymoron, I guess, of uh, career temporary employee. Uh, you know, you got folks that are doing career-related jobs, but on a, on, a, on a temporary basis, you have a general policy that was articulated by Ms. Bailey uh, that says a person can work for a year with one additional year, and that's it, except that we allow a waiver, and now it's perpetual, apparently, uh, for some of these employees. But uh, I, I'm just wondering the, the, uh, the impact on the employees, the, the morale of the employees, uh, productivity, how they approach the job, uh, and the impact on their families and the workers, uh, and, and the peace of mind in terms of, you know, the management and the workforce there, uh, given the fact that a lot of these people are in limbo, 
they are continually re-employed re re as uh, temporary workers without, without any benefits. Uh, how is that impacting the workforce and how is that impacting the uh, conduct of uh, your responsibilities in, in the workplace? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I think it's pretty clear that there are employees that are, are impacted by that. As Mr. Uh, Cashton mentioned, similarly to the Forest Service, we have a wide variety of circumstances represented in our seasonal workforce. And those issues are not true for all of our seasonals. But for those that it is true, it certainly can't be denied. It, is, it has an impact on morale. Is it, you mentioned earlier, you ha you're oversubscribed for these temporary positions. So is it, is it just uh, too bad if you don't like it, we got somebody else who wants that job? Is that, is that how we look at it? I wouldn't say that we would look at it that way, no. Every manager makes their own decisions about who they hire, and there are a lot of individuals that are hired back. Uh, because they want to come back and their manager that they worked for the previous season wants to have them back. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have far more applications than we have available slots for the, the competitively advertised positions that we, that we fill. Mr. Cashton, you, you, in the closing remarks you said that if the administration were willing to, you know, look at this rule again uh, and change its policy, you'd be happy to, to participate. Well. This, this committee is doing just that. You know, we've got a lot of complaints from workers that, uh, you know, that they've been in this limbo for a long time. They get rehired. Uh, they look at other folks that are doing the same jobs that they're doing, albeit, you know, they're, they're full time, full year. Uh, but they, these folks are doing it over and over and over again, multiple years. And, and at the end of the day, you have the situation that was uh, uh, illustrated earlier about an employee who, uh, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, was continually reemployed, re but was denied all these benefits because he felt fell in a different class. Uh, how how do you feel? I mean, you're saying that 44 percent of your career positions are being occupied by temporary employees. Is that is that just a result of the seasonal nature or are we looking at a, a strategy uh, employed by management to, to really try to reduce their their costs and so if we can keep if we can keep 44 percent of the people with no benefits you know no health insurance no retirement no annuity uh, then you know we can manage our budget a lot better uh, Mr. Chairman, let me clarify. I, uh, uh, I, I guess I, I didn't state that fact very well. What I, I meant to state was that of our career workforce, those who have career status, in other words, permanent employees, 44 percent of that career workforce came from the ranks ah, okay. of employees who previously were uh, temporary seasonals. Okay, um, so there is a path to... Yes, and, it, and it's the largest single segment. I do think it's, it's critical to have a variety of employment sources. Um, a career, uh, uh, excuse me, a, a temporary seasonal employees are a very, very large part of the current career uh, profile. That's where they came from. It's a very and, important and, source. And, and, and that, that is notwithstanding the fact that, as in your testimony you said earlier, you've got veterans groups that you've got, you know, you give priority to. Uh, you've got folks coming in from uh, the Peace Corps, so they've got other, uh, I guess, non-competitive status, uh, up, you know, right to appointments as well. And you're still uh, getting 44 percent from the temporary workforce into career status. Uh, uh, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. In, in fact, uh, if you appreciate that a certain segment of our career workforce is administrative in nature, say uh, five or 6,000 employees that don't have seasonal counterparts, uh, those positions that are, are natural resource related, actually the number is up in the 55 to 56 percent range. Okay. I have exhausted my time. I'm going to yield for five minutes to Mr. Bilbray. Thank you. Um, on the average, how many uh, individuals do we have to apply for permanent positions? Anybody know? In your departments? I'd like to see a comparison between the permanent applications and the temporary applications. Can you give me some kind of 
reference? Do you have any idea of that? Well, each year we, we fill approximately 350,000 positions. Of, of those, 150,000 are permanent. Um, at any one given time, we're averaging around 450 people per, per job announcement. And I know that on average, we have somewhere around 2 million people apply for our jobs each year. That's across the board, government wide. I mean, this discussion sort of uh, sparked my interest. I spent six years as, as a seasonal worker. Of course, it's scary to think that somebody, when I start off in 1970, and he was an elderly person, almost 30 years old, was lifeguarding, that they're still out, the same people that I worked with in 1970, a lot of them are still seasonal workers doing the same thing. Um, I guess the, the discussion is, um, one thing we don't think about, many seasonal workers, this is not their only employment. Um, a, lot of, a lot of teachers, uh, a lot of different type of profession, seasonal professions, and they, they mix and match. Do you have any numbers at all of what, what portion of our um, seasonal workforce this is a second, a second income? No, I do not. I don't have any uh, uh, specific data. I, I would, from, from uh, my experience in, in uh, working in the workforce, I, I would estimate that about half uh, or more of our seasonals would ultimately desire a career job in, in the Forest Service. Uh, there are uh, certainly those who uh, don't that I described in the testimony. There's even the one or two I run into now and then that uh, look forward to working for uh, six months and going to Mexico for two months and uh, start to wonder uh, where I went wrong in that. But uh, it, for the most part, it's, uh, there's, there's a sizable number that ultimately want to achieve a career appointment um, uh, in, in, in the Forest Service. Every time I go down to Latin America, I agree with them, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think there's a legitimate concern here that the fact that you, this is not just a, a situation where people are living off of a few months of work. Um, I just know that there are real estate agents who do this kind of thing. There are people that are teaching. There's a whole lot of different professions that find that, um, uh, that ability. People that are in property management can get into this. So I just think that a lot of this discussion is somehow um, focus on a perception that may not be reality. But the other issue is this 44 um, percent. You know, I'm just wondering how much of the complaints are people who think that if they get seasonal and work um, for a few years, that puts them in the pecking order to basically be moved up, which should be true if they're, they're um, employees that we want to participate. But seeing that we have, uh, how many applications do we have for temporary service in, in your department? 150? I mean, um, what was the number that you gave out? Well, I was just saying that of the 350,000 that we um, fill each year, 200,000 of those are temporary or seasonal type. But you don't know how many applications you have for those temporary. No, on average, though, today we get around 450 applications for every job that we announce. Okay. So in other words, the market out there is, is very large. It's, it's, it's an employer's market when it comes to working for the government, even if, if it's seasonal, right? Correct. Okay. So there's enough people on the outside of the system who really think this is a really good deal, even though there may be those in the system once they're in, uh, feeling that it's not a very good deal. Is that fair to say? What's the turnover with our seasonal? We, uh, uh, overall in the Forest Service, in the career ranks, in the career ranks, we're looking at around a five or six percent uh, uh, attrition rate. In, that's extraordinary. In a it's, it's, uh, it's fairly small. Uh, in the seasonal ranks, that's very hard to put your finger on because you're bringing in the factor of those who uh, are not looking at it as a continuous long-term year after season after season approach. Um, so I don't really have any data on Okay, on just for so the record, I find it extraordinary that we would want to limit seasonal workers for some reason. Um, for to how many years? I'm sorry. I, I still think the old guys that are there, that have been there for 30 years, are probably still the best lifeguards on that beach. Um, and frankly, just because they keep coming back um, indicates that they do enjoy it and we keep hiring them means they're doing a good job. And I worry about this attitude that basically says that we expect, you know, we don't expect seasonals to be around long. I think we wouldn't do that with our, with our full-time employees. I hope we never do that with our seasonal. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. 
Uh, Chair, now recognize we, we've been called for votes, so members will be leaving and coming back in. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton to, to chair uh, in my absence. Uh, but I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Um, let me ask Ms. Bailey, uh, is it your testimony today that uh, abuses have in fact occurred using temporary hearts? No, it is not my testimony today. So there are no abuses. abuses have occurred? I, I cannot sit here. Ma'am, you're going to have to speak. I cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Um, no, we do not believe that abuses have occurred using this uh, temporary appointment authority. Uh, given our oversight and accountability role in this and working with the agencies, we uh, do not believe that there have been abuses. No abuses? Correct. Wow. Okay. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. If uh, we do the census every 10 years, um, I'd ask it of the panel. Now, clearly, hiring temporary census workers to, for a period of a few months, to undertake the initial uh, data uh, collection or, and or to follow up on that data collection because it was inadequate or incomplete somehow, uh, goes on every 10 years. And that, I think we would all agree, is clearly a temporary position. Would you consider it temporary, however, if we did a census every year and we hired that person for six months every year? Is that a temporary hire that, as far as you are concerned, perfectly legitimate and could go on until that person re retires? Is that a correct use in the federal work for, workplace of this category, temporary hire? <laughs> Mr. Cashton? I'm sorry, Mr. Connolly. I thought that was a question for... Uh for Ms. Bailey there. I'm sorry. I, I was just opening up to any of you. Okay. Um, the, uh, we use an appointment. We call it a 1039. I think the correct term is a uh, uh, less than 1,040 hours. It's the type of temporary authority we use that is specifically used for work that is seasonal and temporary in nature. Uh, sometimes I think we, we overlay the issue of benefits uh, with that, uh, we we do not use this authority for the purpose of denying benefits. Uh, if benefits were part of that, we'd still use the authority. Uh, we use it. We use this authority because it is particularly the one that is geared for work that is temporary and seasonal in nature. And we have quite a quite a uh, a few of our of our seasonal employees that do work almost that uh, right up to that 1,040 hours. But. And that's not to say it's not something that uh, many of them are frustrated with. But, yeah. uh, I'm just asking a different question, though. I, I, I'm glad you, you told us about the practice. But at what point do we have to agree we're sort of doing an end run on the system and calling someone temporary? And what is the time limit for somebody uh, to be in that status? I, I thought federal regulations, you went through, Ms. Bailey, in your testimony, you know, changes the law going back to the 80s, but is is the current practice or the current law, as you understand it, literally ad infinitum? There's Actually, no limit. If I could address your um, your initial question with regard to the census takers, and if we hire them back each year, is that really truly temporary? In that particular case, what what the current law and what our regulations allow for is an agency could make a, a decision to hire them either as temporary employees or as permanent employees, and either one could carry what we would call a seasonal um, a seasonal um, work schedule. So in other words, if something is reoccurring every year, we would probably suggest to an agency that rather than, than use temporary employment, that you would make those permanent seasonal employees or permanent because it is reoccurring. Does the Forest Service do that? In, uh, in certain areas, actually, particularly California is an example where we have career seasonals uh, for exactly the reason that uh, we're talking about here is the fire season could go very long, could go uh, six months, it could go uh, uh, longer than that, and also for other reasons of, uh, of uh, trying to have a, 
a workforce that we've uh, been able to retain over a longer period of time, provide uh, retention in incentives. Uh, so there are areas where we do have career seasonals. Now, along those uh, northern tier states uh, uh, where the work is primarily field, we'll, you'll find less of a profile that are career seasonal and more temporary seasonals. Uh, so it really, it really varies with the work and the fluctuation in the work. Um, you know, in the forest products area, that work may fluctuate from year to year, and we don't know how many uh, seasonals we'll need. In fire, it's fairly predictable. My time is almost up, but Mr. Simpson, I want to give you a chance to respond. I would echo what uh, Mr. Cashton said. We also have a mixture of, of seasonals who are on career appointments as well as seasonals who are temporaries for, for the same reasons. My time is up, Madam Chairman, and I, I thank you. Uh, I just want to say I, I am stunned by Ms. Bailey's testimony that she has, that they have never found, are not aware of, any abuse of the use of temporary hires. That's an extraordinary statement for a force, a workforce as large as the federal government, even a, even a workforce as normally perfect as ours, uh, there's got to be abuse uh, now and then. Um, and I think that's a challenge, frankly, for this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Bailey, would you like to <laughs> revise your statement in any way? I mean, you just, uh, uh, my colleague says that you have, you've just come up with a perfect system. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I think it is safe to say that that we do have through our oversight uh, role. If we do find a situation where there is an abuse that is occurring, we will absolutely go in and work with that agency in an informal manner. Uh, we can do all kinds of things from training the hiring managers to training the HR specialists. Do you keep records of where you have found abuses? Um, it's actually yes in our oversight when as part of our oversight and accountability we keep records of all agencies where we have found a finding of a violation and then um, we make a record of that for both the agency and for OPM. Well Ms. Bailey it would be very helpful if you would submit to the uh, subcommittee uh, within the last uh, let's say two years uh, to give us some sense of when what kinds of, uh, of, of uh, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, would, yes, Mr. Conway. Would you yield just for one point? Indeed. I thought Ms. Bailey's testimony in answer directly to my question was, we have found no such examples, none. And now I'm hearing Ms. Bailey say, well, actually, when we find them, we do take corrective action. And if you wanted to correct your statement, please feel free to do so. But I'm leaving here with your answer under oath to my question that you have found no examples of the abuse of the use of temporary positions in the federal workforce. And that, sir, I do not want to change. That is correct. We have not found one instance of an abuse uh, under this authority. Uh, apparently, GAO data showed that 11 percent of the temporary employees had worked more than five years. Would you consider that an abuse? Well, it really depends on exactly under what conditions these folks are working. Well, they got a waiver. I keep getting a waiver. Wouldn't automatic waivers constitute an abuse? I am not aware of any instance where an agency has abused the automatic waiver situation. They have applied it appropriately um, wherever we have um, actually used our oversight authority, they have applied it appropriately in accordance with the OPM regulations. Well, then you're back to Mr. Conley's point, uh, point that if, they've applied it, if they have applied it appropriately, you wouldn't have to go in uh, and retrain and otherwise correct the abuse. That's the problem we have with your testimony. Okay. But I think that will be clarified if you just do what I asked you to do. For the last two years, would you submit for the record? I understand there may be a, we may have a, a definitional problem. Uh, uh, you may regard uh, what an employee has, uh, what a manager has done as a mistake. Uh, whatever it is, we're not trying to play any gotcha, gotcha here. We're just trying to see how the system works. So if uh, you would provide uh, uh, for the chairman within 30 days uh, a record of those instances where you, OPM, have gone in uh, to assist managers or employees with respect to uh, temporary hires. That would, that would assist our record. Now, as I see it, this hearing is really about two things. One is benefits, 
and the other is a merit system. Uh, we see temporary employees as valuable. In fact, some places uh, indispensable, as in the National Park Service, for example, or Forest Service. Uh, I'd be interested to know, though, Ms. Bailey, because we here have more typical, uh, we have before us managers from more typical temporary uh, service uh, agencies. I'd like to know what percentage of temporary employees are outside of these seasonal, the, the seasonal area that we've just heard of and where we see the, 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 the uh, critical uh, need in order to function. I am not sure of the exact percentage that well, is we understand that they are in virtually every category that agencies uh, far from just the park service or the forest service the IRS and and you name it all feel free to use temporary employees uh, it would benefit our record to know what percentage come outside of these seasonal employees and yet are temporary employees that are used across the government Within 30 days, uh, would you uh, submit uh, that information to the record? Uh, Mr. Cashton, I was uh, uh, interested in your testimony. Uh, it seemed reasonable that there were a fair number of people, even yourself, who came into the government first as seasonal employees and then became full employees. Now, a concern, of course, is how does this a key with the merit system. Could you tell us in your case how you were able to become a merit system employee while beginning as a temporary seasonal employee? How were you able to compete? Sure, Ms. Norton. Uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, clarify that even in the, uh, the six-month seasonal, there is an initial period where uh, there is a competition and you do have to uh, 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 go through a process where you consider such things as veterans preference, that kind of thing. But it is much, uh, your, your probability of getting into the seasonal workforce is, is much more enhanced. And then after that, you can be recurringly appointed if you uh, are not exceeding the 1,040 hours. In my particular case, I applied, uh, uh, I don't even know if they have these anymore, anymore, but back in my time, I applied for what we called OPM rosters, and, um, and I was on a uh, recurring list for civil engineering technicians, and uh, at the point that the uh, forest that I had in fact moved to in, in order to enhance my chances of getting a career job, uh, they decided to fill the career job, went to the roster, and, uh, and I was available, uh, so I was able to be picked up off that roster. So the merit process was going through the OPM roster, being ranked, and being entered on the roster. And, uh, and that's how I got in. It's the same way that our chief, Tom Tidwell, got into. So you were competing with people who had no experience? I was competing. I'm, I'm well, sorry, I, I, I shouldn't say who had no experience. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Some of them may have had certain kinds of experience outside of the government. But you were competing with with um, people who would have would have not had experience in the agency you wished to uh, work for. Uh, yes, Ms. Norton. Uh, I was competing at that point in time. I believe I was a, a GS five, and in fact, I was on a GS four roster. So I had uh, some years. It didn't matter where those years were; they were experienced that credited me. And so, qualified the, the, me so that's so what I want to get at. When when you are competing for on the merit side, uh, and perhaps Ms. this is a question relevant for Ms. Bailey as well. Uh, to, can, to what extent does experience uh, received on the seasonal or temporary side count or help employee to obtain permanent employment through the merit system? Experience is something that, that counts whether, regardless of, of how it's acquired. So if it's acquired under a seasonal appointment or a temporary appointment, or if it's acquired outside the federal government. So let's take a federal firefighter that it happens to be working on a seasonal basis. Not only would that experience count, if then in the wintertime they're also a firefighter uh, with the uh, city of New York, that experience, combined experience, would count and then give them credible experience toward 
uh, whatever position that they are applying for. So it's, it, we don't make distinctions based on an appointment type or a work schedule. Experience is experience, no matter how it's gained. Let me ask you, Ms. B Ms. Uh, Bailey, um, since the, at the time of the death of, of James Hudson and the whole city was moved by this hardworking man who just kept working, uh, because he obviously needed to work with, with a family. Um, so far as I can tell, all that happened was there was a cap put on the number of years a temporary employee could work consecutively. Is that right? Yes. As part of our review of, of that particular case and then in consultation with the agencies and discussing um, how best to, to balance both the mission accomplishment with uh, what is in the best interest of the employees, that is correct that we did put in our temporary employment regulations allow for one year of employment and then one year extension. And the, the whole intent of this was to Although get Although we, I've just, I've, I've just quoted you numbers that show a healthy number who, who work five years. When, when they work five years, is that because um, there's a shortage? If they are or is it because the, the, these employees are regarded as the workplace Work for, work, workplace usually regards employees They're looking for experienced people and so they keep picking these people up. It, it may depend, uh, ma'am, on which kind of appointment that they're actually using. If it's some of the employee, some of the, um, the agencies are able to, given the other exception that is in our uh, temporary employment rules, is that if they are working six months or less, which is the 1040 or less. If they are working that, then they can, we do allow for indefinite one-year extensions at a time, and that's how someone could work up to five years. Mm -hmm. I see. So you think they may be in that category? Yes. I mean, given, given the, the situation that you described, I do. Uh, I, th I think uh, James Hudson's death raised uh, rather definitively the notion of benefits, however, so much so that Congress, in fact, gave Mr. Uh, Hudson's uh, wife and children uh, benefits, $34,000 uh, retirement benefits in effect. Mm -hmm. um, that's one man. Um, there's never been retirement benefits given for any other person, has there? Not that I'm aware of. That was a remedy because a man, for, for a man who, who, who dropped dead on the job. Now, let me ask you, um, in light of the health care legislation that just passed, uh, has OPM looked at health care for temporary workers? Or are they to be considered outside of uh, the penumbra of a bill that claimed to cover 95 percent of the American people? We have actually um, discussed this whenever um, the administration uh, first, when President Obama's administration first came in, we had the um, the Recovery Act, and at that point in time, we had issued a, a Schedule A authority for agencies to use to hire temporary workers to come in and to assist with the Recovery Act. And at that time, the question did come up with regard to health benefits, and so we took a very good, uh, close look at both our regulations and the law. And the way the law is currently written, it is written in such a way that it excludes temporary employees from receiving health benefits. Private and public sector, you're saying? Oh, I'm only speaking to federal sector. I cannot speak to private sector. Um, in testimony before us, one or all of you have indicated that after a while, perhaps a year, you can get health insurance if if you, the worker, are willing to pay for it, you can get in the FEHBP, Fair Employees Health Benefit Plan, if you are willing to pay for it. Is that right? Yes. After one year, even temporary employees are eligible to um, apply for health benefits as long as they pay the 100 percent contribution of that. So in other words, the, why the would they, employer Why would there not be a shared benefit for these employees? Why would the federal government employ people and pick up? Well, first let me ask you, what percentage of people? And these temporary jobs, which are not your highest paid job in the federal government, in fact, take on coverage 
100 percent of the health care costs? How many? What percentage do that? I don't have the answer to that, I would think you'd want to know. After Mr. Hudson's death, it may be a quite empty uh, promise. What is the policy reason behind the, the uh, notion of coverage if you want it but don't ask us to contribute anything to it? What's the justification for that? In this particular instance, we are not unsympathetic to this issue, and we would be more than willing to work with the subcommittee with regard to health benefits for these federal employees. I appreciate that, Ms. Bailey. We understand the difficulty uh, raised here. Uh, uh, episodic employees will always present uh, issues when it comes to benefits of various kinds. One can even understand uh, the, the uh, retirement notions and how difficult that would be, uh, but then there's Social Security. Um, I understand that seasonals, however, don't, re don't receive uh, any access to, to the Fair Employment Health Benefit Plan. Is that right? If they are permanent seasonal employees. What is that? Permanent seasonal would be an, a permanent employee who works seasonal, meaning more than six months or more. I see. But there, there are over a thousand less than six month seasonal employees. The number we have, the number we have, Mr. Mr. Cashton, Mr. Simpson, those uh, less those less than six month employees have no access to health care. Let me let me clarify. Uh, uh, if we there again there are career seasonals and there are temporary seasonals uh, career seasonals do get uh, health benefits if they have a, they have career status in the in in the federal workforce they do get temporary they do get uh, health benefits life life insurance those under temporary appointment non career status um, that uh, as Ms. Bailey mentioned if they are in an appointment uh, that is where they work less than a, a year, uh, they don't get uh, health benefits. So the, the large amount of our temporary seasonal workforce is in fact a six month or less type category, the 1,040 hours, and, and they do not qualify for, for benefits under regulation. Now, I, I recognize, I don't know, some of these may be, I think it was you, Mr. Caston, who said that you, know, you could have teachers who are, um, seasonally out of work for themselves and so they pick up seasonal work uh, they may in fact have health care we do need to understand in light of the health care bill how many people we're talking about that simply don't have health care that we're carried on the roles of the federal government this would be a terrible embarrassment it seemed to me to have another James Hudson type uh, incident I don't mean death I mean someone becomes seriously ill on the job, happens to be a federal employee, a seasonal employee, and ex has no access to health care, despite the fact that we've touted the, the health care bill as covering almost everybody. Uh, and it, we, we have to understand that this is a very different workforce. The workforce of pensioners who work full time, I'm sure that may, may have been the case for the federal government at, at some point, or something close to it. Uh, that's a workforce of the past. And I'm not sure, Ms. Bailey, uh, that uh, OPM has looked at this new workforce as uh, a, 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 in light of benefits and in light of status. Um, it, it, it's going to be important for us to know how many of these, se these seasonals, these less than six month seasonals, uh, have health care. Now, we know they don't have health care from the federal government, but they may have health care. So we need to have an accurate picture. I don't even know if we have a problem. We may. Uh, and if we do, it does seem to me that the first workforce that would have to take account of it would be the federal workforce. We probably have this, this problem throughout the United States. Uh, we have sought in the health care bill to correct this problem for seasonal workers on some part of the country, I might, I might add. But then if we're sitting on, on such an issue ourselves, it would be uh, an embarrassment and worse uh, for the federal government. 
Uh, I'd like to dismiss this panel. Thank you for very helpful testimony on an issue that we are confronting anew and you have enriched our record. Thank you very much. Thank you.